tonight. Just want to remind you that we are meeting every night uh, until through Wednesday night. Now, it'll be at 6.30 tomorrow night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. So we pray you'll be back at 6.30 on those nights. Uh, tomorrow night is Children's Night. And so I uh, hope, hope you'll help us spread the word. All our children's, uh, anybody you know with children, they are invited. Parents and children are going to have a, a, a we're going to start with them at 6 o'clock. We're going to have a meal for our kids, and then we'll have a program for the younger children in the other building. The older children will be here with us. But please get the word out, and we're just going to hopefully have a, a house full of uh, children and parents tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. But anyway, we're so glad you're all here tonight. And we have, we have come uh, expecting God to do some great things tonight. In fact, in fact, he's going to do some great things tonight in many of your lives and all of us if we'll be open to what he's got to say to us. And so I just want everybody here tonight just to be wide open to hear the Holy Spirit speak to you. David? You know, uh, we are going to pick some children up tomorrow night. And so the answer to that is yes. Uh, if... Uh, Okay, all right, so, so if you know of someone who needs a ride, then just, then just call me, call the church, and we will we'll get them here because we are going to run the van. We already know that. Thank you for that, all right? So we just want you to know that uh, God's here to do a mighty work in many hearts and lives tonight, and if you have a need tonight in your life, uh, you bring it to Jesus sincerely. You'll find that need met, no doubt about it. He is here to change our lives if we will just open up and say, Lord Jesus, I'm ready for you to do that. And so as we uh, begin tonight, we're going to do as we did this morning. We're going to begin with a word of prayer, a time of prayer, season of prayer. And then Shannon Knight is going to come and lead us in singing. We're so ha happy to have Shannon Knight with us all week long. And uh, many of you already know Shannon. He's been here numerous times at Arbor Springs. And we uh, love Shannon. And uh, Shannon, thanks so much for uh, your ministry and being willing to be here with us this week. And um, we're just excited about your leadership all week long. We're so thankful that uh, Steve Freeman is our evangelist for the week. Uh, Steve is the pastor of Grace Baptist Church in Springfield, Tennessee. Uh, great church, doing great things for God. And Steve's a dynamic preacher, as uh, you know if you're here this morning, but also leading that church to do great and mighty things. That, that It's making a difference in that community uh, and even in a broader perspective as well. And so... Steve, thank you for taking your time to be with us, and uh, we just appreciate you so much. So, uh, Karen, if you'll just uh, uh, play for us, uh, if, if you want to come to this altar for this time of prayer and asking God's blessings, you feel free to come. If you don't, just stay right there where you are, but let's bow for prayer right now and ask God's blessings and just uh, go to him asking his intervention in this service. Would you do that? Lord, we already sense your presence in this place. We know, Lord Jesus, you are here to change our lives. We know, Lord, you're here to save souls tonight. We know, Lord, that you're worthy and capable and powerful for doing all these things. So right now, Lord Jesus, we bow at your feet, and we ask you in your precious name to show yourself to us, Lord. Lord Jesus, show us ourselves and let us see who we are, Lord, and let us be willing to confess what you show us, Lord, and, and own up to, Lord, our faults and failures and our sins. And Lord, lay them at your feet. And Lord, just leave them there and beg you to change our lives. And Lord Jesus, tonight I pray you're going to change many hearts and many lives. 
people will be birthed into the kingdom. And God, your children be more made more like you. And Lord, I pray today you'll be glorified in all you do tonight. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to be here tonight. And God, we just give you praise in advance for what you're going to do. And Lord, we ask it all in the mighty, matchless, glorious name of Jesus Christ, your Son, for his honor and for his glory. Amen. Shannon Knight. Amen. I'm come. already back here behind yeah. you. Amen. God bless you, brother. Y'all give the Lord praise. Put your hands together and thank him for this opportunity. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles, if you've been hearing the same old voice till the same old lies, if you're trying to feel the same old holes inside, there's a better life, there's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, sing it. He's a chain breaker. Somebody say hallelujah. Oh, I hear you. Listen. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all run to things we know just ain't right. Here's some good news. And there's a better life. Oh, there's a better life. Pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. Oh, here's an opportunity for us to testify on a Sunday night, and I hope you'll help me do that. Listen. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. Oh, come on, give him praise. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify, testify. If you believe it. can feel it somebody testify if you got pain he's a pain taker if you feel lost he's a way maker if you need freedom we're saving he's a prison shaking savior if you're not changed he's a chain breaker oh if are saving he's a prison shaking savior if you got chains y'all sing it right here sing. sing that part again he's a chain breaker he's a chain breaker yeah. come on praise him church Woo. Y'all, y'all sing that if you got pain sing he's a pain taker oh y'all know this saying if you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom, if you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you've got chains, sing it. Let's do that part again. If you got chains, well, it's like choir practice. Ain't it? If you got chains, he's a chain. Everybody go, who? Oh. Oh, didn't that sound good? Come on, praise the Lord for tonight. Thank you. Thank you for You know what? I wasn't going to do this, but I know every time I've ever come to Arbor, y- y'all are a singing bunch of folks. And this one song, I, I, over the last several years, I think every time I've ever come, I did this song. So you're going to have to help me. Could y'all just stand up? Everybody just stand up. Now, now this, this has kind of gotten to be an old school song, but you tell you something, it pretty much takes off. It goes, it says, can't nobody... Do me like Jesus. I think some of y'all might have took a nap this afternoon. 
Amen. Well, I think we're about to wake up right here, right now. Can y'all say that with me? Now, don't, don't, let's, let's don't say it like laid back. Let's say it like this. Say, can't nobody. Say it. Do me like Jesus. Oh, y'all sound like y'all ready. I want y'all to help me with this tonight. Come on. Oh, let, 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 here we go. Woo! Come on, put your hands together. Come on, church. Oh, yeah. Woo I know you got your mask on, but I can hear you. Come on. Well, can't nobody do me like Jesus. Can't Nobody do me like the Lord. I said, can't nobody do me like Jesus. He is my friend. Now y'all sing it again. Here we go. Well, can't nobody do me like Jesus. Can't nobody do me like the Lord. Sing it. Can't do me like Jesus. He is my friend. Listen. Well, he healed my body. Then he told me to run on. He healed. If you've ever been healed of something by the Lord, raise your hand. Come on, wave it like this. Oh, yes. Then he told me to run on. I'm here to tell you Jesus is my friend. Sing it with me now. Can't nobody do me like Jesus. Can't nobody do me like the Lord. I said can't nobody. I'll ask you a question. Now, if you're saved, if you know you're saved and not saved, woo! Oh, do it again. Say, woo! If you love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, say, yes, I do. Say it. Now, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, hey, neighbor, you're singing so good. Come on, tell him. He saved my soul, wrote my name upon the roll. He saved my soul, wrote my name upon the roll. He saved my soul, wrote my name upon the roll. I'm here to tell you Jesus is my friend. And he filled me with the Holy Ghost. He saved me and he filled me with the Holy Ghost. I know he filled me with the Holy Ghost. Yes, he did. And I know he is my friend. Sing it with me now. Can't nobody sing it. Do me like Jesus. Sing it. Do me like the Lord. I said, can't. Do me like Jesus. He is. Now, y'all sing it by yourself. Now, you really say, here go, sing. Can't. Lord, I said, can y'all got it? Do me like Jesus. He's my friend. Sing that part again. He's my friend. He's Come on, sing it one more time now. He's my I know, I know oh, that Jesus, he is, he is. Give me praise tonight. He is my friend. Oh, somebody thank him again tonight for what he's done in your life. Oh. My wife had coffee. She brought it here. And I promise y'all I ain't drank no coffee. I'm just excited, amen. Oh, we ain't going to do that again. I'm going to hurt myself if we do that again. But I do want to hear y'all. Before we sing these songs, I, I want to hear y'all sing that a cappella. I, I told the, uh, Brother Steve that uh, I've got three years of education. And all three of those years were at a two-year college. How smart am I? Somebody said, thank goodness he can sing a little bit. He'd be in trouble, right? But, 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 but I want you to sing that a cappella. I looked that up, and it means without music. How about Google, amen? Y'all Now, y'all sing it. Now, I know y'all can do this. Ready? Can't nobody do me like Jesus. Sing, can't nobody do me like the Lord. I said, can't nobody y'all got it. do me like Jesus. He's. Sing that last part one more time. He's my friend. Oh, the Bible says he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. It said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. How many of you are thankful for that tonight? Amen. I want us to go back to a, a song. It's pretty far way back, but 
I remember it coming out when, when the contemporary music came on the scene, and I've loved it ever since. I'm getting old. You know, I remember contemporary came out before contemporary even got cool yet. That's how old I am, amen. But this song says, Lord, I lift your name on high. Isn't that a great old classic contemporary? Let's sing this together. You know this. You shouldn't sit there and go, I don't know this. Y'all remember this one from way back. But what a great song with a great lyric for any time we come together to think about what he's done for all of us. Just give us an intro there, Miss Karen. You do a wonderful job. Y'all sing now. Y'all go help me. There it is. Oh, let's sing it again. Lord, I lift your name on high. Sing, church. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad. I'm so glad you're in my life. Sing it over here. I'm so glad you came to save us. Here's my favorite part. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross my debt to pay from the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky lord i lift your name on now i want all the men if you're a man in here say uh-huh say it man i want y'all to sing it with me sing me lord i lift your name on high just the men come on guys sing lord i love to sing your praises I'm so glad you're in my life. That sounds good, man. Sing. I'm so glad you came to keep it up. Just the men singing out. Here we go. You came. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on. All right, if you're a lady in here, go, uh-huh. All right, ladies, y'all ready? Here we go. All right, ladies, y'all sing. Here we go, sing. Lord, I lift your name. Come on, ladies, you got it. I can't help this too high. Lord, I love to sing. I'm so glad. Sing it, lady. That's good. I'm so glad you came. I'm so glad you came to sing. Come on, ladies, sing. You came. Let's go back. Everybody sing, you came from heaven to earth. Let's do that. Ready? Y'all ready? Sing, you came from heaven. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. How many are you thankful that he did that for you? I mean, really? Greater love hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friend. Put your name in the blank there. That's you. That's me. When he was on the cross, I was on his mind. It's personal. Isn't that great to be reminded on a Sunday night to, to, to know that he, he loved you? He gave his life for you. Yet while I was in my sin, Jesus died for me. Dottie Rambo wrote a song one time. says, if that is it, love, the ocean is dry. There are no stars in the sky, she said. If a sparrow can't even fly, if that isn't love, then heaven's a myth. She said, there's no feeling like this if that isn't love. Talking about Jesus going up on that cross. Let's sing one out of out, that. Let's go, let's go back to one of the great hymns of church that I dearly love. It says, what can wash away my sin? Just give me that chord, Miss Karen. I know I talk every time. Just give me that chord. Okay. What can wash away my sin? Sing nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Sing it. 
nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Sing it. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And he is so worthy. I worship you. Almighty God, there is none like you. I worship you, O Prince of Peace. That is what I want to do. I give you praise. For you are my righteousness. Everybody sing, I worship you. I worship you, almighty God. There is none like you. Would you just take a minute across here as you're standing in the presence of the Lord? Just, would you just bow your head for a moment? When's the last time that all of us really seriously took a moment and said, Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you've done for me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for, I saw all those hands, thank you for healing me. Thank you for shedding your blood, taking your last breath, defeating death and hell and sin, and overcoming the grave for me. I worship you. There is none like you. Could you just, as you stand there, just in your own way, between you and him, could you just begin to praise him and thank him in your prayer, what he's done for you? Probably a lot of you are like me. You wouldn't even be here today if it had not been for Jesus. Take a moment. We're going to sing that one more time real softly after you pray, but just pray a moment. Talk to him. believe that don't you there's nobody can do what Jesus can do amen there is none like you can we all just say his name before we're seated say Jesus say it Jesus. can you say it one more time say it Jesus you may be seated whoo what a sweet spirits in this place Some say this old world's hopeless and some wonder what we're going to do. I just remind you tonight that all our hope is in Jesus. That's all we need. I've been held by the Savior And I feel fire from above 
I've been down to the river And I ain't the same The prodigal returned Oh, my hope is in Jesus Thank God my yesterday I've worn shackles and chains, yes I have. Here's some good news for us. But I've been freed and forgiven, and I'm not going back. I'll never be the same. Sing it with me. All my hope is in Jesus. Oh, y'all know it. Sing it with me out there. God, my yesterday's gone. All my sins are forgiven. Sing it, sing it. All my sins are forgiven. Hope we can all say this tonight. I've been washed by the blood. It's kind of personal right here, don't it, tonight? I, listen. There's a kind of thing that just breaks a man. It'll break you down to his knees. Lord, I've been broken more than a time or two. Can I tell you what he does every time? Then he picked me up and showed me what it means to be a man. Stand up and sing it, church. Oh, come on. My hope is in Jesus. Oh, you know what? Sing. Thank God. Sing. Thank God my yesterday is gone. All my sins are forgiven. Let me hear you sing it, sing it. All my sins are forgiven. I've been washed by the blood. Sing it. Oh, you know it now. Oh, sing all my hope is in Jesus. Sing. All my hope is in Jesus. It is gone. All my sins are forgiven. Thank you, Lord. I've been washed by the blood. Praise God. Praise God. You can be seated. Come on, Pastor. Come on, brother. We're ready. Glory, hallelujah. I think let's do that again. I'm going to let Brother, brother Freeman sing that this time. Amen. I believe he can handle it. <laughs> Come on here, I'm trade with you. Hey, give the Lord a clap, pray. Oh, Brother Sam, I wish you would have drank that Starbucks. We'd have been here all night, brother. Oh, my goodness. You're such a blessing. Thank you for all day today and leading us in a time of worship, helping us to understand what Jesus has done for us. Oh, I've been washed by the blood. All my sins have been Forgiven, mm, washed in the blood. We talked about that name, that name Jesus. That name that is above every name. That name to which every knee will bow. Hey, listen, and every tongue confess. I want you to understand tonight 
that you will bow your knee and confess with your tongue that Jesus is Lord. You're either going to make that decision on this side of eternity, on the other side of eternity. But let me tell you the difference. On this side of eternity, you're bowing the knee and calling him Lord and Savior. On the other side of eternity, you'll say that before you're cast into hell for all eternity. That's the difference. You say, Pastor, that's a little harsh. No, that's just the Bible. That's what the Bible helps us to understand, how important that decision to place your faith and trust in Jesus. The Lord has given him a name that is above every name to which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. There's no other name given under heaven among men by which we can be saved. Folks, I want you to understand that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life and no man comes to the Father but through him. Understand this, listen. Understand this, I don't care what they say on TV, and I don't care how many ways that they try to convince you that, that you can get to heaven. You're not going to get to heaven but one way. You're not going to pour mouth your way to heaven. You're not going to buy your way into heaven. You're not going to beg your way into heaven. You're not going to steal your way. You're not going to cheat your way into heaven. You're only going to get to heaven when your sins have been forgiven, washed in that precious blood that flows from Emmanuel's veins and that pardon received, paid in full, from the cross at Calvary. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he made him a new no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we could become the righteousness of God. Oh, I pray that that's the decision that you made. And if not, I pray tonight that you will. Now, that's not even in my notes. I just thought I'd throw that in because it's important. If you have your Bibles tonight, turn with me to the book of James. The book of James is going to be close to the end of the New Testament. The book of James. And I want us to look at chapter 2 and verses 18 through 23 tonight. James chapter 2 verses 18 through 23 as we give thought to a sermon that I've simply entitled Friend of God. I think it's uh, by no coincidence because we don't serve a God of coincidence. We serve a God of purpose. But it's... Kind of interesting that we sang about this a little earlier tonight, Brother Shannon, being a friend of God. So while you're turning to James chapter 2, verses 18 through 23 tonight, I want you to understand that in your life, and this is important for you young people, and I'm glad you're here. Brother Josh, what a great job you've done in, in getting all of these young, young folks here tonight. I even think that not only should we throw Brother Mike in this, hey, why don't we throw Brother Shannon in this? I... We get 50 kids in here. I think, Brother Shannon, that it's going to look good. Brother, it's going to look good. <laughs> and like Samson, like Samson. But in our lives, are you listening to me? I want to make sure you're listening to me because especially young people, this is important. In your life, you're going to meet people. People are going to, you're going to come in contact with people all your life. It, it, it doesn't matter how old, how young. And, and all of these people, when you think about it, when you have a remote connection of any kind, any kind of formidable fellowship of any kind, every person that, that you share that with is going to find, find its way in one of three categories in your life. They're either going to be an acquaintance, they're either going to be a friend, or they're going to be a foe. Now, I don't have time tonight to preach on the foe and what we're supposed to do on the foe, so I'm going to stick with the acquaintance and friend. But I want you to listen to me because you're going to have, uh, in your life, you're going to have acquaintances, you're going to have friends, and you're also going to have foes. Acquaintance, by definition, if you will, I kind of jotted something down. Uh, I, I call it a Freeman translation. But acquaintance is somebody that you know socially but not necessarily intimately. It's not somebody, maybe it's, it's, it's a friend per se, a friend from benefits. I said from benefits. But it's a friend. Basically, their, uh, their, their friendship or their kinship with you is based on something that can be derived or something that can be received either on either side, both parties. And, and I want you to understand there's nothing wrong with having acquaintances. I promise you this, you're going to have more acquaintances 
then you are going to have friends. And it's okay because we need acquaintances in our life because there's times that we need a friendship or a fellowship with somebody when there's a benefit on the other side, a benefit for them or a benefit for you. There's nothing wrong with having acquaintances. But every person that you have a remote connection with is going to find its way in the category of friend, acquaintance, or foe. So an acquaintance is somebody, again, that you have a remote connection, but really there's a benefit. They're connected to you because there is a benefit, but a friend. A friend is somebody who knows you. A friend is someone who, who's, in a, who, who, who's a part of your life, and, 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 it's, and it's more than socially. It's intimately. They, they know you, and they love you. They know the good. Hey, come on. They know the good, the bad, and the ugly, but they still are your friend. They're still close to you. You say, well, Pastor, how do you know the difference? Well, you know the difference. Hey, here's the easy way. You want to know the difference of if that person's an acquaintance or a friend? Call them when you need something. I said call them when you need something. See, acquaintance, they'll be there if it benefits them. A friend will be there if it benefits you. we got to have acquaintances in our life. And we've got to have friends in our life. You know what's interesting? I, I think I may tell you, this is going to catch some of you by surprise maybe. I don't know, maybe not. Brother Mike, it did catch me by surprise when I was studying. But think about this. We need friends in our life. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible says you can have too many friends. Did you know that? Now think about this. The Bible says over in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24, a man with too many friends, a man with many friends comes to ruin. The Bible says that we, we need friends. There's no doubt in our life we've got to have people who love us unconditionally. We've got to have people who are there when we help. And listen, this is important about church and being a part of a church family because in your life you're going to need friends. You're going to need people who can help you in a time of need because if you're breathing, come on, if you're breathing with your mask on, but if you're, if you're breathing, you're going to need some help at some time in your life. Whether it be, I don't know, on a small scale or the large scale, you're going to need somebody. You're going to have flat tire. And you're not going to know how to change the flat tire. Somebody's going to have to come. You're going to need some help in your life. So you need some friends. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible says you need friends. But you can have too many friends. I'm just telling you, I get struck on that because I never really thought about that. I mean, the world will tell you. Look at me. The world will tell you you better get all the friendships you can. And they're not really talking about friendships. They're talking about acquaintances. They're talking about false romances. They're talking about all these things that are not going to benefit your life. But they'll tell you you need to get all kinds of friends. But the Bible says you can have too many. And if you got too many, guess what? It's going to lead to your ruin. I never thought about that. But, and that's from Solomon in Proverbs chapter 18. But do but, but you know what else he goes on to say in his infinite wisdom? He says, a friend, a man with too many friends comes to ruin. But there is a friend, come on. There is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Now, I, th I believe Solomon in his infinite wisdom was projecting and I believe he's talking look in my theological estimation I believe that Solomon is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ as a friend that sticks closer than a brother that's the kind of friends you need now we need some friends in our life but friend listen to me there's one that you gotta have and his name is Jesus so the question becomes how, how do we get to be a friend of God. Now, how do we get to be a friend of God? We know how we can become a child of God, but I'm not talking about being a child of God. We know how we become a child of God. We believe what we sung about tonight. We believe what, what the Bible says about what Jesus has done. We believe what the Bible says about us. And, and we put all of this together, and we're willing to give our life over to the one who gave his life for us. We believe that we need a Savior. I want you to understand tonight that you need a Savior. Every single one of us in this room, it doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter where you come from, doesn't matter how rich you are, doesn't matter how poor you are, doesn't matter how good looking you are, doesn't matter how ugly you are. We all, guess what we all got in common? 
Y'all want to guess? Called sin. We're all sinners. I know some of y'all looking because some of y'all guessed. You know, and they, y'all brought some guests tonight. They're looking and thinking, well, what'd they tell you about me before I got here? <laughs> plenty, plenty. But I mean, we're all sinners. The Bible says, for we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. There's no one that can escape that. So we're all sinners. And guess what a sinner needs? A Savior. Because we can't unsin ourselves, and we certainly can't save ourselves. There ain't nothing you can do. And we've all broken the rules somewhere. So we need in need of a Savior. And the Bible says that we have one. We have one. His name is Jesus. And if you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And as many as received him, John chapter 1, verse 12, as many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God. So we know how to be a child of God. But I'm not talking about being a child of God. I'm talking about moving beyond the realm. I'm talking about getting out of the kid zone and getting up in the friend zone. That's a good word. I'm glad I came for that. You can use that too, Shannon. I don't know. It just came to me while I was standing here. I'm not talking about just being a child. I'm talking about elevating this fellowship. So how do we become a friend of God? That's what I want to talk about tonight. James chapter 2. Stand, if you would, for the reading of the Word of God. And in James chapter 2, verse 18 through 23, I'm going to show you tonight, basically give you three requirements. These are three requirements of us in order to move Come on, I'm going to say it again. From the kid zone to the friend zone. Three requirements. What's required of us to be called God's friend? Hey, can I ask you this? Is that what you'd want to be known as? Would you want to be known as a friend of God? It's important to be a child of God. That's where it all starts. But I wonder... In my spiritual imagination, when we get up to heaven, I don't know how it all works up there. But, Mike, I don't, I've studied this thing, and I just don't know how it all works. And I think that's part of the, part of the mystique, if you will, that, that Jesus, I, I, they didn't tell us all that heaven's going to be like. I know it's going to be a good place. Come on. He said, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. You know what the King Jimmy says on that? Mansions. I like that. Mansions. Oh, can you imagine about them mansions? Boy, I'm about ready to get one of them mansions. I'm tired, you know, because my plumbing don't work. I'm about ready to get one. I ain't got to worry about that plumbing. But, I mean, think about the mansions. Think about the food. You say, Brother Steve, we're going to eat food in heaven. You better know it. Uh, it'll be cheesy spaghetti just like we had today. It wasn't that good. I'm thankful for that. I, I've decided y'all at Arbor Springs trying to kill me. Y'all trying to fatten me up for the kill. I can guarantee you. I know what it was. I preached a little long this morning. Y'all thought that y'all, y'all thought that y'all could fill me up and shut me down a little bit. I took a nap. <laughs> I got 12 minutes. But I wonder in my spiritual imagination, when you walk in the streets of gold up there, and boy, you used to get down there at the corner of, Gold Avenue and Pearl Street. I'm making these up. But. And there comes Jesus walking around the corner. Just out on the morning stroll. He may have been jogging. Just out on the morning stroll. And he bumps into you on the corner right there. Just loving on you a little bit. Because you know that's what Jesus does. And then walks off. Maybe see Shannon down the road. Say, hey. And Jesus says, says to Shannon, hey, Shannon, did you see Steve? Oh, I seen him the other day. Boy, that's one of my best friends right there. I wonder if you'd want to be a friend of God. And we'll give you three requirements tonight. If you want to move, now you take notes tonight. 
If you don't care anything about being a friend of God, it ain't no sense in taking any notes. As a matter of fact, you don't even have to listen the rest of the night. It's not going to do you any good to listen if, you, if you're not interested in elevating where you are with the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you want something different, friend, then tonight the Word of God will shed light on our hearts about what we can do to just move this thing from a monumental, well, just, a, just a mundane, everyday checkoff list. Listen, this is why we need revival because this is how we live our lives as the church. Checkoff list. Went to church this morning. Check. Sunday school. Can't check that box. Read my Bible. Check. What did you learn from it? So many times we read the Bible. And we're reading the Bible. We don't even know it. We got the Holy Spirit of God. We got the greatest tool that the Lord has ever given. His word inspiring. It literally guides us. Textbook for life. We read it. Don't even know how to heed it. What are we doing? We're going through the motions of this thing. Check. Got saved. Check. Got baptized. Check. Some of you can't even check that box. I worked on that baptism this morning. You say, Pastor, I mean, is it really important that, that we get baptized? For crying out loud, you're in a Baptist church. I mean, surely we think it's important. We put it in our name. But why is it important? Because you want to identify on the team. I worked on that all all morning this morning. There's so many A's out there with the curly Q on top. I mean so many elephants out there. Ain't nobody mistaken who you're for except Shannon. He's the only one with a war eagle out there. And you know, they're Auburn Tigers with war eagle symbols. You, you can't comment. Yeah, but we got enough championships that we can sustain that, you know. Come on. But I'm, I'm just saying, everybody knows what team you for. But do they know what team you're on? How many people at work know you're a child of God? Seriously. How many people at school know, know you're a Christian? We get up in here and pray, raising the hands, praising, praising the Lord. This is a safe harbor, and it should be. But listen, we're doing all that just to get ready to go out here for Monday morning. Sunday, just dress rehearsal for Monday. We, what does that look like at school? What does that look like at work? Hey, maybe you want to be a friend of God, but here's the thing. Would you tell your other friends about God? Your friend? All I'm saying is we're going to have to do something different. This world out here is, is a mess. No, it's not a mess. It's a hot mess. A hot mess. We got all our hope in, in the next presidential election. And I'm going to tell you, I don't care if you ride a donkey or an elephant to the pole. Don't make any difference to me. If you think either one of them clowns are going to save the day, you got another thing. There's a, you got a problem. Did you not watch that presidential debate? That was like a hot circus. That's what that was. That's, our, that's the hope. Is that what you're going to put your hope in? Now, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I just told you this morning I spent a whole sermon series trying to teach people how to vote. Because you've got to vote for one of them. But we're called to be the world changers. Salt and light, isn't that what Jesus said? You're the salt of the earth, the light of the world. 
You know what salt does? Come on. You know what salt does? A whole lot of stuff. It's one of my favorite vegetables. Can I get a witness? Salt preserves. We're to be the preservators. Preserving our culture. Well, you know what else salt does? Make you thirsty, don't it? Come on, y'all had some country ham before? I know some of y'all had country ham. Y'all had lots of it. <laughs> but you know what it'll do? That country ham, boy, it'll make you thirsty, won't you be? We ought to be the thirst creators of culture. You know what else it does? Everything that salt touches, you know what it does? Changes the flavor. You know what we ought to be doing? We ought to be changing the flavor of society. Instead, society's influencing the church. This is the most powerful instrument and tool that God has left in the physical earth on the planet used and designed to change the world. And we got churches closing the doors. I can't, we can't, you can't speak for the other churches. But the question is, what are you going to do personally? And what does that tie in to Arbor Springs or wherever you, church that you may belong to? And allowing it to be exactly what God designed it. But I think when we get our minds right and our heart right and our priorities right, I think if we'll move into the friend zone and get up out of the kid zone, I think we can make a difference. And God will use you to make a difference. He'll use you. Eleven men turned the world upside down. How's he going to use you? James chapter 2, beginning in verse 18, going down to verse 23. I'm going to give you three requirements that we have to meet in order to become a friend of God. But someone may well say, verse 18, this is James, the brother of Jesus. There's nobody more qualified to write this letter than James, the brother of Jesus, who later became the pastor of the church of Jerusalem. You know why he was qualified? Because he was not a believer in Jesus' lifetime. Only got saved after his resurrection. The same with all of his family. They thought he was nuts. So many times they went and tried to get him. Even carried Mary, the mother of Jesus. Because they knew they couldn't do anything with him. Mama, you go with us and get this nutball out of the city. They're making fun of him. They didn't even believe who he was. But then he got saved. And God used him mightily. Look here. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. <laughs> Let me read it like I want to. You believe that God is one, well, isn't that special? The devil also believes. You know that the devil believes in God. All oh, this is going to be important. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Father, help us to just move into that zone, Lord. Take us where we are and move us to where you want us to be. Father, I know that there's some that are here tonight and have been saved. And Lord, I'm getting ready to... Look, we're going to talk about this. But Father, there are many who are gathered here and watching by way of broadcast that have been saved. But it's time we get busy for you.
time. We move out of our spiritual apathy and laziness. And to move into that flavor changing, light showing mindset and heart set. God, would you move? Move in our hearts, move in our midst. And do what only you can in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Three requirements that we must meet in order to become a friend of God. The first requirement that we must meet in order to, this is going to be your first point, write this down. The first requirement that we must meet in order to become a friend of God is the fact that in order to be considered God's friend, we must acquire the understanding. Acquire the understanding. The Bible says in verse 18, but someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. But the demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith, believe, faith, that faith without works is useless? Now, this is important right here. Again, this is James outlining one of the basic and most prominent fundamental aspects and foundations of our life and spiritual life. Really, here, if we just had to boil it all down and we're looking, James is taking the opportunity to explain really the difference between faith and belief. Now, that's important to get because oftentimes we get these, inter we use these terms interchangeably, faith and belief and all throughout Scripture, and it's not scripturally wrong to do so because they are so close. But listen to me, and it's going to be important. Listen to me when it comes to salvation and laying the foundation of our eternal perspective, our eternal life, we have to understand what James is saying. When it comes to salvation, when it comes to a person's life and their soul being saved by Jesus, there's a difference between belief and faith. Again, anywhere else, in any other context, Brother Mike, they can be used the same. But these words, they, they, they have a different connotation as it applies to salvation. James uses the word uh, believe, and that word believe in the original Greek language is pistuo. It pistuo, and it literally means to think or understand something to be true. So when you believe something, look at me, when you believe something, you think or understand whatever it is, you think or understand it to be true. You believe it to be true. You think or understand. But he uses the word faith, which is the word pistos, and it literally means a strong and overwhelming conviction of the truth. So the difference in this regard, in belief, you think or understand something to be true or you know something to be true by overwhelming conviction in regards to faith. He uses these words, and this is important. And this is where we get hung up a lot of times. And this is where, uh, this is a large problem with society, but this is especially down here in the South, way down here in the in the Bible Belt. See, you down in the Bible Belt, down here in Northport, in Samartha, Alabama, right down here, you're not only the, uh, the, 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 the belt buckle, all right, but you're the little notch that holds the belt in the hole. You know, I mean, you're right, hey, you're right down here in the heart of it. Are you listening to me? And I mean down here in the south, I, I, we have a, a Christianized culture, per se, and there are a lot of people. There are a lot of people that you meet. I'm going to go ahead and tell you that about 85% of the people in this county, 85% are not saved. About 85%, okay, on any given Sunday, about 85% of this community is not going to be in church. You say, Pastor, do you have to go to church to be a Christian? Yes. Now, you, you, you don't have to go to church to get saved. But once you're a child of God, the question is not, because, do I have to go? Is when do I get to go? <laughs> so don't come at me with I don't have to be, uh, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. If you are a Christian, why wouldn't you want to go to church? I love, but I'm about, I've had it up my eyeballs with that mess. That's just ignorant. 
Where else are you going to serve? You say, well, I mean, I mean where, hey, where are you going to give? Well, we can give online now. Well, la ti da Give it online. But where are you going to worship? You say, well, I can worship at home in my living room. Yes, you can, but are you? I can worship in the deer stand. I ain't. Mm. I worship in the deer stand. You know, I've been hunting for many years, and I've never heard any praise and worship, Shannon. I never. Have you ever been invited to come lead a, a, a worship service at the deer club? You ever been on? I, I can worship the Lord on the, on the lake. I just get out there, just me and the Lord. Yeah, and your fishing pole and all the bait and all those fish you're trying to catch. This is important. We're going to get some. Pri We're going to have to restructure and reprioritize our lives, ladies and gentlemen. We're just going to have to get priorities right. It's Jesus first, and everything else comes after that. But this is one of the hardest aspects about trying to reach into the culture. Because here, Brother Mike, and this is a problem in the church. I'll get to that in just a minute. But you, you talk to somebody about Jesus or, or you out here witnessing, you know, and you know what the standard answer is. Y'all listening to me? I mean, and you tell somebody, you get out here throwing down that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and all, and no man comes to me. He's the only way that we can get to heaven, and, he's, and you got to have your sin forgiven, and, and all of that. You go through, and you're giving them the gospel. Well, the fact that Jesus died for you, sin was buried, and on the third day God raised him from the dead, you give them all that. And they'll say, oh, yeah, well, I believe that. You know that most of the people, most of the people in this community aren't saved, but most of the uh, people in the community believe that they are. That's the problem in the church. There's a large portion of the church, Brother Mike, that if, that if Jesus was to roll out and get on that cloud, come on, hit that, I'll get you on that midnight cry here in a minute. But if he was to step out, you know, call his children home, that First Thessalonians chapter 4, that rapturo, I'm just in my eschatology, I'm pre-millennial, pre, uh, 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 pre-tribulational in my, in my study of last things. So I just believe that the next thing that's going to happen on God's prophetic calendar is that it's called the rapture. When those uh, who are the dead in Christ arise first, and then those of us who are alive and remain will be called up. Rapturo, that's where we get the word rapture. We'll be called up together to meet the Lord in the air and forever be with the Lord. I just believe that's what's going to happen, and it could happen at any moment. Friend, there is nothing left. There is nothing left to be fulfilled for Jesus not to come and take his people home. But here's the problem. There's going to be a whole lot of people who now believe they're going that are going to miss that call. There's a whole lot of people who believe they're saved, but they're not. And it all boils down to understanding pistuo versus pistis. There's a whole lot of people who think or understand salvation, think to understand the gospel, think to understand Jesus and all that's wrapped in to be true, to think or understand. But friend, I want you to understand that what counts is our faith. What counts is when, when we know and have an overwhelming conviction that what the Bible says. And an overwhelming conviction is not just something you give with lip service. It's something that moves in your life. You say, well, how do, we, how do we know the difference, Pastor? Maybe you're here tonight and you're thinking, well, I mean, do I got pistuo or do I got pistis? Which one do I got? Do I got belief or do I got faith? Well, friend, all you got, if you want to know the difference, look at the fruit of your life. Because when a person... Hey, when a person has faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says over in Ephesians chapter 1 that God moves in in the person of the Holy Spirit. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit. And in that, when God moves inside of you, you can't help but be changed from the inside out. 
If you won't know if a person's saved or not, and I, hey, I know, and the people will say, well, we're not supposed to judge. That's the business between God. Hey, listen. He's given us the, the, the fruit, and, and, and we ought to be fruit inspectors on people. This is important. We ought not, we mess around with all that. We, we come up with the stupidest stuff. Excuses not, not, not to do what God has charged us to do. Oftentimes we say, well, it's not left up to us. That's between them and God whether they're saved. Yeah, how about when they start dating your daughter? Don't you want to know? How about when, you, when they start dating your son? You won't know if they're saved or not because the Bible says not to be unequally yoked. If, we can't, if we're not to be unequally yoked, but yet and again we're not going to do any fruit inspection, how on earth are we going to know if we're sending our kids to the slaughter or not? You better do some fruit inspection. You know what the difference is between a person who believes and a person who has faith? The fruit. You know what the Bible tells us what the fruit is over in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. Y'all remember that? The fruits of the Spirit. What are they? The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy. So y'all need to go to Sunday school next week. Love, joy. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and se ooh, self control. I mean, this is a telltale way. I'll give you some more ways, but I'm just telltale. Let's just start there. Are you a person who loves? Because this is a person who, the difference between one who believes in God and one who has faith in God. I remind you, the devil believes. But he ain't got no love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness. And he certainly doesn't have any self-control. But what about your life? Don't answer, just think. Are you a person of love? You love other people? The Bible says over in 1 John... The one who says that he loves his brother, the one who says that he loves me but hates his brother is a liar. You got love for other people? How do you treat other people? How do you treat other people? Well, I treat them how they treat me. Well, I'm glad Jesus didn't take that stance, aren't you? You love other people, love, joy. Are you a person of joy? The people, the people at your workplace, the people in the community where you play ball, the people, do they know you as a person that, but that, that, that there's, I mean, that person is just fired up. That person is full of joy. It's unshakable, even in the midst of a COVID-19 communist Chinese virus pandemic. It's unshakable in your life. Is that who you are? Is that how people know you? Is that how people know you at school? Is that how the teachers know you? Is that what they categorize when they call your name at work or when they call your name at school? Do they, does it bring a smile to their face or an eye rolling? Are you that kind of person that exuberates just an emotion of happiness because you possess joy. You just love life. Life is not ever going to be easy. Listen to me, young people. Y'all think this life is going to be easy? Ain't nothing out here going to be easy. Nobody's got it easy. I don't care how, how much they want to put on, they do. Nobody out here has got it easy. This thing will chew you up, spit you out. But when you possess Jesus, you get joy. Joy is not an adjective. Joy is a noun. It's something you get with Jesus. Is that how you're categorized? Love, joy, peace. Mm. What about you? You live in constant turmoil in your life all the time. What about your family? Constant. Is there, are you a person 
of chaos or are you a person of peace? Are you a person of protest all the time? Are you a person of peace? Do you have peace? Not as the world gives, John chapter 17. Not as the world gives, but as Jesus gives. He said, as I give. The peace that surpasses all understanding. Is that how you live your life? Is that how you've operated in the midst of a, a, a pandemic? When the stock market doing like this? Is that where all your hope is in the stock market? Are you just a person of peace? And knowing it's going to be all, listen, it's going to be all right. Either way, when you're in Jesus, you don't have to worry about all that stuff. You ain't got to worry about the money. You ain't got to, uh, listen, it's not that you don't have any responsibility, but you don't have to worry. He's going to take care of it. If he'll take care of the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, how much more value are you than they? This what? Peace, love, joy, peace. What's that next one? Patience. Let's skip that one. You see my point? Fruit inspection. If you're going to be a friend of God, it starts with understanding where you are in God. You can't be a friend of God until you're a child of God. And do you believe in God or do you have faith? You have to decide that tonight. That's a decision that you have to, to, to work out with the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants you not only to be a child of God, but I promise you, He wants you to be His friend as well. That brings me to a second requirement. Second requirement that we must meet in order to become a friend of God is the fact that in order to be considered God's friend, we must advance in obedience. We must advance in obedience. So we're going to acquire the understanding and then advance in it, obedience. Look at verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You know that Abraham, later in this passage, Abraham was called a friend of God. You know why he's a friend of God? You know how he got that category? Because Abraham was an obedient man to whatever God said. Think about this. Now, I don't have time to tell you the whole story. You can go read it in Genesis chapter 22. But there, Abraham. Abraham and Sarah. In Genesis chapter 18, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, Theophany, the Lord Jesus Christ himself came and visited his friend Abraham on the way to Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy it. But when he visited in Genesis chapter 18, he told him the good news. He said, this time next year, Abraham, this time next year, your wife's going to be pregnant with child. Now, that, now, God had already promised them this. And I mean, it's been a while. Um, 25 years they have waited on, a, on this promise from God. 25 years. And he told them, this time next year, that, that you're going to have a baby. Yay! You're going to have a baby. But Sarah, you know what? She wasn't saying yes. You know what she was doing? She was laughing at the Lord. <laughs> She was, you know why she was laughing? Because here comes Jesus now. He shows, <laughs> he shows up going to tell them they're going to have a baby. And here they are, Abraham, 100 years old. Boy, wouldn't that be a blessing. Come on. I'm looking across the crowd. Wouldn't that be a blessing at 100 years old? <laughs> he told Abraham. Hey, buddy. That's the Hebrew. Hey, buddy. Got some good news for you. you and this time next year, you and Sarah. He might have had that little Alabama on it. It wasn't Sarah. It was Sarah. You and Sarah. Y'all going to have a little bundle of joy. Can you imagine now 100, 100 years old? Hmm. <whistles> Boy, that sounds good, doesn't it, Brother Mike? <laughs> you get that haircut, it may just happen for you. <laughs> but here, 100 years old, going to have a baby. Now, you know. Now, one, they only had one child. At 100, I mean, that's all you can handle. 
But he didn't have but one child. So you already know anybody in the house, anybody a, a only child in the house? Anybody a only child? <laughs> okay, close your ears. All right, so you know these, you know an only child. Do you know how spoiled rotten they are? Come on, can I get a witness? I mean, can, so you can imagine. And not only this, Abraham and Sarah going to have a baby. They going to have a son at 100 years old. Have y'all ever, is anybody in here a grandparent? What are y'all ashamed of? Your grandkids? Get your hand up. I mean, you're a grandparent. Come on. You're not ashamed of them. Listen, you just want to talk our heads off about them grandchildren. I love you, but I mean, come on. I know they're the greatest thing, and I know that they are the cutest. Why is it that all babies, according to grandparents, are all beautiful? I've seen some ugly babies, Brother Mike. And, I mean, they want to show me these pictures uh, back at the church. They're so proud of these grandbabies. And they're saying, Brother Steve, I just want you to look how beautiful they are. And I'm thinking, that's the ugliest kid I've ever seen. <laughs> but can you imagine? Because they know the grandparents, the grandkids can't do nothing wrong. You know, I mean, nothing wrong. So here they are having a child at grandparents' age, and it's an only child. There's no hope for this child. He going to be spoiled. Rotten. But don't you know, because you know grandparents, I'm not a grandparent yet, but you know grandparents how precious these grandchildren are. I mean, they, hey, forget the kid. When the grandkids come, the kids are out. Yeah, I mean, forget them. They, don't, they can't even remember. They, look, my, my dad can't even remember my name half time. <laughs> but the grandkids, when they come, the kids is out. These people are special. They are special. And now Abraham and Sarah, their grandparents, they're going to have a grandbaby even though it's a son. This thing is going to be terrible. Don't, if they ever, listen, they put Isaac in the nursery, everybody quit. So you know how precious. They waited a long time. And not only that, they waited 25 years just from the time that God told them they was going to have a child. But you know how precious this thing, how valuable this thing. This was Abraham's most prized possession. And you know what God told him to do? Kill him. Kill him. Now Abraham, because of his faith in God. He knew God's character. Listen, go back and study this. He knew God's character. I wish I had time to take you over there and show you in Genesis 22 when they got over to the, uh, to the Mount Moriah, when they got over there where the temple's built. And he told the men, he said, guys, this was on the way to sacrifice Isaac. This is what God called. God's testing his faith right here. God's testing to see if he's ready for the next level. He, called, he told him to sacrifice his child. But Abraham knew God's character. Abraham knew that God is no murderer and God is no liar. He promised him a child that was going to be the blessing of all the nations. We're here today because of the promise made to Abraham. And he had faith in God. He trusted God. He knew God. He knew God was a God of his word. And look what he said to those men over in Genesis chapter 22. He said, hey, hey, there's the place. You guys stay here, me and the boy, me and the lad. We're going to go over to worship. And listen, don't miss this. And we'll be back. I broke a mic this morning, stage tonight. <laughs> this revival is going to cost y'all a lot, Brother Mike. I hope they're giving. He knew and trusted and had faith. And this is exactly what James is talking about. He said, listen, was not Abraham justified in who he was and established as the friend of God because of his overwhelming conviction of the truth, because of his faith? If you're going to be a friend of God, you know how Abraham got out of the kid zone and into the friend zone? He was obedient to what God told him to do, no matter what it was. He, was, he told him to kill his child, the precious grandbaby son child, only child. And he said, okay. Let 
me ask you this. What has God, what has God called you to do? What has God called you to do? And the question is, are you, are you, are you going to do it? Are you ever going to do it? You do realize that we all have a purpose in this life, right? We all have. The Bible says in Jeremiah 1, 5, Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you and I set you apart. For Jeremiah is to be a prophet to the nations. But what does he set you apart to do? What kind of, I told you when you get saved, I, I, uh, the Holy Spirit comes and takes up residence. You know what he brings with him? A spiritual gift. A supernatural empowerment to be an impactor to the kingdom of God. What is your purpose? And how does that mesh with the gift? And all of that depends on what you're doing with it. Are you deployed in the kingdom of God? What are you doing? What about your obedience? What, 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 what is that? What, what has he called you to do? And are you willing to do it? And not only in purpose, but just in practice. What about, the, what about obedience in your life? Hey, are you obedient to read the scripture? You, hey, you know one thing that I can figure And you ain't got to, listen, you ain't got, you, mm, you ain't got to get a degree to figure this out. But let me tell you what's not going to happen. You're not going to learn anything about this book if you don't open it. You're not going to know anything about what this book tells you about your life, what this book telling you about Jesus, what this book's examining you, how to live, what to do, what not to do. You're not going to know any of that if you don't pick it up and read it. You know what obedience is? Employing spiritual disciplines in your life. What about praying? Are you a prayer? I pray all the time. I'm not talking about when, you, when, when you're desperate for God to do something in your life. It's about the only time we pray, isn't it? When we need Him. Treat God like that spare tire. You know what I'm talking about. How many of you tonight drove here to church? How many of you drove? Well, I didn't see none of y'all walking down the road. Now get your hands up if you drove here. If you drove. All right. Brother Kirk, did you check your spare tire before you got in the car? You, di you didn't look at the spare tire? Now what if you had a flat tire? I mean, do you have a spare tire? You in bad trouble. Hey, <laughs> I, I, you better get you a friend. <laughs> and I don't think Jesus is going to help you with that one. I don't know. Don't call on him for that. He may say, boy, I curse you. he sure was dumb not getting a spare tire. But listen to me. Listen to me. But Mike, do you drive here? You got a spare tire? Did you check on it before you got here? When's the last time you checked on that spare tire? Have you ever needed it? Well, praise the Lord. But you know what? That's exactly how we do the Lord. He wants to be the driver in the driver's seat. You know, back in my younger days, you, you remember those uh, bumper stickers and those uh, was license plates that said, God is my co-pilot? They didn't even get that right. God's not looking to be a co-pilot. He's the pilot. But anyway, I'm just nostalgia today, you know. But I, I mean, you think about it. God wants to drive the car, and you know where we place him? We get in the driver's seat, and we don't even let him sit in the passenger seat. We put him in the trunk. Get back there and I'll call you when I need you. You want to be God's friend. You want to be called and considered a friend of God. And we don't even talk to him every day. We don't even hear from him. Are you obedient in little things? In the, in the everyday, these disciplines of serving and giving. Hey, what about giving? You obedient in that? We're always trying to find a way to get out of that one, ain't you? Preacher, you could have gone all week and not said anything about that tithe. Well, you know I ain't going to do that. Well, you obedient in your tithe? You say, well, that tithe's Old Testament. I love when people tell me that. You know, that tithing. Well, the tithing's Old Testament. It's Old Testament. It's nothing about tithing in the New Testament. Yeah, over in the New Testament, Jesus says, give it all. Well, that Old Testament, it ain't that bad. Now, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. It's pretty good. We'll just go to that Old Testament. Preacher, did we give on the big number or the little one? Gross or net? Hey, how about just give on the big one in case you get it wrong? 
What's he going to say? You gave too much? What about that? Are you, are you, so is that important? It's a reason why he put it in the Bible. You know, he, Jesus talked more about money than he did heaven and hell combined. You know why? Because he knew it'd be your issue. He knew it'd be our issue. If you don't tithe to your local church that you belong to, if you don't have a local church, you need to get one. But if you don't tithe to the local church that you belong to, you are out of the will of God. Stop making excuses. Stop trying to find loopholes. Just give the check. It's not about money. Jesus said you can't ter- serve two masters. You either love the one and hate the other or be devoted to the one and not to the other, but you cannot serve both God and money. And you know where he measures it? I'll give you a hint. He doesn't need your money. You understand, God makes trees on the weekend. He don't need any money. He needs your heart. He wants to measure where your heart is. That's why you put the check in there in the offering plate. That's why you get online. That's why you text the money. However you want to do it in this newfangled world makes no difference. Just do it. Because he's measuring your heart. Are you obedient in the practical application, the practical things? If not, we'll never move from the kid zone to the friend zone. And brings me to a third and final requirement. Third and final requirement. I'm going to make this quick. Only got about another 45 minutes. Now, I want to play Uno and get some finger foods. What are we going to eat? Finger spaghetti? (laughs) Third and final requirement. Write this down. That you achieve. So we acquire, we advance. And we achieve, we achieve perfected faith. I'm going to make that, I'm going to read this passage. I'm going to make this simple for us because it goes back to obedience. It goes back to everything I just preached in point two. You see that faith was working with Abraham's works. And as a result of his works, faith, Abraham's faith was perfected. This is verse 22. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says that Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteous. And he was called the friend of God. Abraham was a friend of God because he had perfected faith. You know what perfected his faith? He got busy for the Lord Jesus Christ. James says, faith without works is worthless. It's dead faith. It's not faith at all. Even if it's an overwhelming conviction, if it's not occupied by works, you've misled yourself. Works do not save us, only faith in Jesus. But works validate that we're saved. That's why you have to go to work. In closing, I want you to close your Bibles. As a matter of fact, we've been sitting for a long time. I want you to just stand very quietly, very reverently. I just want you to stand. And Brother Shannon, if y'all want to get ready, we're going to have a time of invitation. But here's what, here, very quietly, very reverently. I just want you to look at me for just a minute. The question becomes tonight. I go back to my original question. Do you want to be a friend of God? Do you want something different? Do you want to move from where you are to where he wants you to be? Then here's what it's going to take. You're going to have to acquire the understanding. Are you saved? Do you have belief or faith when it comes to your salvation? You've got to work that out. I said you can't be a friend of God to your child of God. And then we're looking at advancing in obedience. What is it you need to do tonight? What what has he been laying upon your heart, even for the past few weeks, few months, or even few years? I go back to what I said this morning. I believe somebody's being called in ministry. Friend, I want you to know. (laughs) I I just want you to come. I'll tell you by the authority of the Word of God and personal, uh, by, by my own personal testimony, it would be the greatest decision that you ever make. Greatest decision getting saved and then going to work. And if he's called you for something spectacular in particular, 
do it. For some of y'all, it, it may not be ministry or full-time ministry. It may just be service, recognizing what you're supposed to do in the community and then how that ties into your church. Who are you inviting to church? Are you vocal about getting people to church? I proved this morning that God will do things here that he's not going to do out there. So you might well bring them here. Y'all bringing your teams, football players, you invite them to church? You going to? How are you going to stand out and move from the kids' zone to the friends' zone? Some of you have been working on that baptism. That thing's tore you up since I've been. I said it this morning, said it tonight, it's tore you up. Some of you got tore up on that tide, didn't you? And you know, you found every excuse, and it's easy to do in the COVID pandemic season, ain't it? But it, uh, why don't you get that right with the Lord? Why don't you come put a check on this offer? Get that right. Get that off your chest, and let's 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 move forward. What about church membership? Your salvation. If you've never been saved, I want you to come. This is the time. This is the moment right now that you'll make a decision that this will become the first day in the rest of your life. Father, help us to know and understand what that looks like and what it means. Father, in this invitation, we're inviting you to show us exactly where we are, exactly where you want us to go, and, Father, move in our faith to get us there. Lord, I pray that right now your Holy Spirit move. As you lead, we'll follow. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. As we sing, as we begin to sing, songs going to end, the words are going to be on the screen. As we sing, pray, Brother Mike will be down here. Other encouragers. I could Other encouragers to be coming. I want you to come. Pastors, staff, I want you to come. And then I want you to follow right behind. Right now. Step out where you are and let's get in the center of God's will. What is it that you need to do tonight? Do you want something different tonight? He's offering it. But now is the time. The Bible says today. Now is the time for salvation. Now is the time for decision. What do you want? You want to do something different? You want something different? It's available right now, friend. I beg you to come. I beg you to come. Come and receive. Come and receive what only God can give you. Oh, would you come? The Bible says taste and see. Come see how sweet the Lord is. Would you come? Do not turn Let's get committed tonight. Now's the time. Somebody here never been saved. Now I want you to come. I want you to come right now. Listen, we're going to continue singing. Here's what I want to explain to somebody here. That burning in your chest, it's the Holy Spirit of God. All that, what you feel like butterflies and then you feel anxiety. That's just that spiritual fight that's going on inside your mind and heart right now, okay? But here's what I'm telling you. I'm telling you exactly what's happening and then I'm going to tell you exactly what to do. When we go to singing here in just a minute, I want you to just step out where you are. You come and grab these guys and they're going to help you. We're going to help put a... Put to bed whatever this is, this issue. But somebody here has never been saved in that burning. That's the Holy Spirit calling you. <laughs> and that's the old enemy trying to fight you to say, just to hang on. They'll be almost done here in a minute. you got plenty of time to get saved. Don't believe the lie. Don't believe the lie. I'm telling you today, right now, is the time for salvation. If there's other decisions. If somebody here has never been baptized, why not? When you gonna baptize that little girl, brother Mike got saved this morning? Shh. We're gonna talk to her, but don't you want to get in on that? 
Get in on this baptism. Hey, and some of you, and Brother Mike, you know this better than I do, because I don't know everybody here. I know a lot. But there's some y'all been visiting this church. What's keeping you from being a member of this church? Don't you like it? I'm telling you, I like if I was if I lived in Tuscaloosa, I'd be a member of Arbor Springs. I'm just telling you, this thing is awesome. I've seen this thing for decades. And I've never seen it like this. And I've never seen it like this. All these young people. Go and get in on the ground level of this thing. And come on. Go in the church. Hey, how about this? If you've been sitting on the sidelines, it's time to get busy. Didn't you hear what I preached tonight? It's time to get busy. We got to get off our blessed assurance and get busy. So you know what you're going to do tonight? In just a moment, when all these other decisions are being made, you're going to step out and you're going to come, grab Brother Mike by the hand and say, listen, give me a job. Give me a job. I'll teach Sunday school. I'll, I'll, I'll teach in the nursery. I'll be an usher. I'll work on the communication. I'll work on the security team. I'll work on the security team. Why wouldn't you want to wear a gun? <laughs> and Brother Mike, when you go back taking up an offering, let that security team t be ushers. They give better when there's guns involved. <laughs> hey, listen. Let's stop playing around right now. And as we sing, I want you to come step out. Come on, as we sing. Come on. Him, come on. I would come on. He died. Don't hold it. Don't hold on. Come on. Without come on. him. I'd be enslaved without him life would be hopeless but with Jesus thank God I'm saved Jesus Oh, Jesus, do you know him today? Do not turn him away, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus. I ask you that question one more time. Do you know him today? Do you know him today? There's some people here who do, know, do not, not know Jesus. I believe. Too many people here tonight. The reason I say that. For 100% of this congregation to know Jesus. I beg you, as this preacher begged you, I beg you, as the Apostle Paul said, be you reconciled to God. We pray you in Christ's stead. We beg you be reconciled to God. And God is speaking to some of you tonight to be reconciled. And you don't know him. And your heart was pounding out of your chest. I remember that feeling the night I got saved. And I remember what a joy it was knowing that I got it right that night. And some of you need to get it right. Well, you'll have an opportunity to do that. Before you leave, if you'll just grab me or grab Brother Steve or grab Josh or grab one of our other uh, spiritual leaders, you can do that, and I pray that you will. But I also pray, dear brother and sister, I want to tell you, I love you. You remember Arbor Springs, I love you tonight. We're the family of God right here. And I'm just so thankful that I'm a part of this family. And I'm just praying that uh, God's going to do work in your life that will change your life as long as you're in this world. You're already going to heaven. 
but I just pray you'll be different because of this meeting. And I pray you will not, 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 not let God work in your life and change you before the week's out. Please pray. Please pray that tomorrow night God's going to get a hold of somebody's heart and do a marvelous thing. Maybe your own heart, somebody else. But, but let's just ratch up the prayers this week. Ratch up the prayers for ourselves and for this revival. I pray you'll do it. And we'll see God move for God's people to get a hold of God. I promise you. Call upon me and I will show you great and mighty things that you know not, he says. I pray you'll do it. But I want to thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, uh, Shady Grove folks, other churches that were present. Thank you for being here and blessing us with your presence. Thank you, Corey. Bring your folks. And we just pray you'll uh, be blessed uh, because uh, uh, God's, since you're here, we, we just pray a blessing on you as you've blessed us. Uh, I want to remind you that uh, we don't pass the plate anymore, of course, uh, but our, our offering plates are at both doors. And we have an offering plate in the other building as well. We pray that before the week's over, you'll give a, a worthy love offering just to show the men of God how much we appreciate them. The offerings tonight, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, will all go uh, just to bless uh, Brother Steve, Brother Shannon. Uh, and, and don't miss that joy of, of, of blessing God's man. The blessings will come back to you, I promise, as you... As you uh, as you bless the men of God. So don't miss that opportunity this week, and God will bless you for that. So thank you for being here. God bless you. Hope to see you again tomorrow night. Tell somebody about the meeting. Tell somebody. If you, uh, if you got a bulletin this morning, there was a flyer in that bulletin, give that to somebody tomorrow. And say, look, come to revival meeting. And, uh, and they'll come, perhaps. And they'll tell what God will do with them. Thank you for being here. God bless you. And uh, young people, hang around. Y'all going to have some fun afterwards, right? Uh, we, we need a little help uh, transitioning, uh, right, Melissa? So uh, if, you're, if, if you have three tables over there, one over here, and uh, just three over